So uh, let me say, first of all, thank you to the uh, Vancouver Foundation and the Neighborhood Small Grants who had provided uh, funding for the Zoom license, for example. So if you feel you have uh, some sort of an endeavor uh, that will benefit the community, you can uh, approach them and uh, they will evaluate it and uh, possibly give you funding. So Vancouver Foundation and Neighborhood Small Grants. So this is uh, investing and in personal finance basics uh, with uh, myself. And so what we'll do for the first 10, 15 minutes, however long it takes, we will go through uh, very quickly what we covered uh, on Tuesday. If there is uh, more information that you would like, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel where I posted the recording. And uh, you can also reach out to me uh, on the Gmail address and uh, I'm happy to to chat with you. Uh, so really quickly. So what we did uh, last time, we did glossary and building blocks. We talked about risk. We talked about starting early and low fees. And we talked about investing strategies. And we're going to start with taxes today. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions from last time? Stuff that they woke up in the middle of the night about and uh, really wanted to ask. Um, Peter says, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but depending on your situation, you could have different buckets of money and different risk tolerance financial avenues. Uh, you certainly can. Uh, that is totally specific to you. And so uh, that's where I talked about the three bucket strategy where you have uh, different types of investments in each one. Uh, so that is definitely specific to you. Um, so it looks like Grant couldn't make it. Could you get the recording? Yes, I will be posting it uh, early next week, probably on Monday. I will post this session on the YouTube channel. So that will be on um, uh, Canadian Money Talk. And I will email uh, notifications out again. If you're subscribed to my website, uh, canadianmoneytalk.ca. If you're subscribed there, you'll get an email. And for those of you who aren't subscribed, um, I got your email addresses from when you registered for the Zoom seminar, and I will email you a separate notification. So you should get it. Um, and I think I should be able to process it by uh, Monday so you can review it prior to the final session, which will be next week on Tuesday. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, let's go here. Okay. Uh, so the main goal for me of this course uh, or of these sessions is to get you interested in learning more about investing. In the six hours that this is going to take, you're not going to be uh, so ready for um, doing it on your own, you are going to have to do some reading and uh, educate yourself further. So that's what I want to motivate you to is number one, to start and number two, to educate yourself uh, a lot further. Uh, okay. And the other thing is, as we're going through here, if you haven't started or if you have started in some way and you don't think that that's the right way of for, for you, for example, if you have a financial advisor, then uh, and you want to do it on your own, then try to determine uh, what you want to do, how you want to invest, what your style is going to be, and then you can start researching the uh, the best brokerage uh, for you. Uh, so Peter says, just to confirm, MERS are paid annually. My personal statement should show this. So uh, no and no to both of those. So Peter's asking whether the management expense ratio is paid annually, and it's not. Uh, they take it out whether on a weekly or a monthly basis at the most. You don't really see a drop in the share price of the mutual fund or of the exchange-traded fund. 
uh, or not that you can attribute to the management expense ratio. So they take it out slowly over time. You don't see a big drop. But the thing is, there's not a separate line on your statement that shows that they took it off. They do have to disclose it, but it's not part of your buy and sell transactions. So it's part of the vehicle, uh, part of the investment, and you don't really see it. Um, recently or fairly recently, the government has uh, mandated uh, that brokerages and financial advisors need to disclose how much people are paying in the MERS. Uh, so they do that, but it's just not uh, part of your transactions. That's That's my point. Okay, so we covered the goals. Uh, I am not a licensed financial advisor. This is for educational and demonstration purposes only, uh, where you can reach me. Okay, so glossary. The main takeaways here is that stocks, shares, or equity, those are all synonyms, are ownership in a company. While a bond is a loan, to the government or to uh, to a company. So that's the distinct difference. Uh, asset allocation, whenever you hear that, it's just how much of my portfolio is in something like stocks and how much of it is in bonds, how much of it is in real estate and so on. Uh, and then index is a benchmark. It is usually a formula that somebody came up with or there's a list of stocks that gets reviewed once a year by a committee uh, like the S&P 500 bunch of people get together and they say okay um, IBM is out and Tesla is in for example so that's how S&P 500 is composed um, it's it's not something that's done in in a super intelligent way uh, it's it's formulaic is what I'm getting at. Uh, we'll talk about that whenever you see balanced, uh, balanced ETF, balanced mutual fund. That means it includes both stocks and bonds. Okay. Um, passively managed versus actively managed. We covered passively managed means it just follows that formula or that index I talked about or it follows a specific sector like energy or technology, whatever, uh, while something that's actively managed means that there's somebody making day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, bear market is when the stock market loses more than 20% from a recent top. Uh, correction is if it only loses 10%. Corrections are fairly frequent. Bear markets may be once every five years, depending on our luck. A uh, bull market means uh, a run upwards. Uh, okay, uh, sizes of companies. So mega cap means that when you multiply the share price times the number of shares they have out, if the multiplied result is more than 200 billion, then it's a mega cap. So it'll be companies that you've heard of. Uh, large caps will be kind of the Canadian big banks. Uh, all the way through to small cap, which I know two billion sounds impressive, but on uh, the stock market, it's not. Okay, uh, so we talked about stocks, ownership. If you're buying it, depending on your brokerage, you may pay some sort of a, a flat commission for every transaction. You might pay by the share. Um, the nice thing is, is that after that, you don't pay any further fees. Exchange, oops, okay. Exchange traded funds, uh, typically the ones we're talking about are just uh, following a, a benchmark. They're uh, just following a formula. They're passively managed, meaning it's just administration that somebody does, and therefore the, the MER is uh, quite low. Uh, in the U.S., I think there's uh, ETFs with zero MER. In Canada, we still have something. So 0.05% through to 0 0.4, 0 0.6 kind of thing. Uh, you get automatic diversification, which is nice that you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. 
depending of course on what that ETF contains. Next, we have mutual funds. Traditionally, they're actively managed and therefore they will have a much higher fee. Uh, there are studies done that over a 10 year period, only about 10 to 20 percent, 30 percent perhaps, depending on the decade of mutual funds will outperform their benchmark. And so what people have started doing is they say, well, I'm just going to buy the benchmark. And that's why ETFs uh, came out in the 70s, uh, because people didn't like paying the high fees and underperforming the benchmark. Um, I argue you can find good mutual funds, which will outperform the benchmarks and ETFs. Uh, but you do have to keep a little bit of an eye out uh, on them. So a lot of people just do the low fee ETFs. And uh, that I think is is a great way to start. Mutual funds have the same characteristics as ETFs in that they create diversification. Um, and uh, if they're actively managed, hopefully you have an intelligent uh, person making decisions. And you can also have mutual funds which are just following uh, an index uh, as well. So that was that. Uh, I'm gonna go quickly through the the risk. Risk means volatility, movement of your investments up and down. There are basically different assets have different uh, types of risk or or different amounts of risk. So your term deposits are perfectly safe. They're insured, uh, but they will pay you a small return. Uh, while uh, small company stocks will have a lot of uh, ups and downs, but over the long run will have a very nice return. So your financial advisor would help you determine what your risk profile is and uh, put you into the appropriate asset types. Uh, if you're doing it on your own, then you sort of have to have a talk with yourself and determine what types of risk uh, you're or, or how much risk you're willing to absorb. OK, uh, so what determines let me just get to the end here. Uh, just to go really quickly. Um, OK, I'm sort of jumping a little bit. Sorry about that. So there's how you determine what types of investments to buy is number one, your risk tolerance, meaning just psychologically, are you okay if your portfolio drops 5%? Are you okay if it drops 10%? 15, 20? I just see it as part of investing. And so I don't have a problem. Never have I had trouble sleeping, but I know people do. So that means your risk tolerance is low. Uh, second thing is risk capacity. Can you actually afford uh, if your investments go down? Are you having to pull out the money after it's gone down? If that's a possibility, then you need to get in some, into something that's uh, safer. Financial education will also improve the amount of risk that you're willing to, uh, to take. Um, when do you need the money? That's an important one time frame because there's fluctuations in stock type of investments uh, from day to day, month to month, but over a decade, stocks will win out. But if you need the money back in six months, then you should not be in stocks. And then what sort of return do you need? You should not be taking risk beyond the return that uh, that you actually need, right? Why get extra volatility to, to scare yourself if you don't actually need the return? Uh, something uh, that we touched on, and let me go back to here. So um, I talked about something called a bucket portfolio, and you can you can just Google it. And uh, on Morningstar, there's tons of uh, great articles. Uh, it basically tries to in the long run to beat inflation, but also to uh, avoid having to sell something that has gone down. 
So we have different types of assets uh, and we just have buckets for them. Uh, the buckets, by the way, have nothing to do with RSP versus TFSA versus any other type of account. It's the type of investment. So you could have uh, the, the buckets in different types, the same bucket assets, you could have them in different types of, uh, uh, of accounts, which we'll actually get into in a taxation. So bucket one is two years of living expenses in safe uh, cash liquid that you can access. It's not going to, to get you great returns, but what it will do is it will save you from having to pull money out of a, of a downturn in a market. Um, and bucket three, uh, is basically your, your risky stocks. And that should be anything past uh, 10 years of living expenses uh, in your portfolio. So bucket two is eight years of living expenses in sort of high quality bonds, dividend stocks. So that's kind of your middle ground. And then everything else should be in bucket three and that should be growth. And bucket three is what's going to outperform inflation uh, because bucket one would not do very well uh, over the long run, and inflation would actually eat away at it. Stocks are really the only thing that will outperform inflation. Real estate matches inflation, just uh, FYI. So so that's the bucket portfolio that I wanted to touch on. And uh, this chapter, well, we talked about the different asset types. Investments, for me, is something that creates cash flow for you. Uh, speculation is when you need other people's help to increase the asset price by them bidding up the asset by buying it. Um, and so stocks that maybe don't pay dividends, but make a profit at least should, and have increasing profits should be increasing uh, in value. Uh, while gambling is stuff that could go up, but doesn't necessarily have to. Um, start early. Well, let the power of compounding returns do the heavy lifting. Let time do the heavy lifting for you. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're 50, if you're 60. You know, they say the the best time to invest was yesterday. The next best time to invest was today. Like, I, I wish I could tell everybody back to when they were 20 that they should have started investing. But if they didn't, then maybe you can teach your kids at least. Uh, to to uh, Low fees also make the difference. Uh, what I did want to mention is that, uh, or reiterate, is that uh, if you get a mutual fund that is outperforming its benchmark after fees and all of the prospectuses show the performance after fees, then you're still doing better than the benchmark. So just to keep that in mind. Uh, stock markets go up in the long run uh, and they usually stay down for about two years at the most, which is why we have the bucket one with um, with two years of, uh, of spending. So that was that. Um, investing strategies, we talked about lump sum when you put in uh, the entire amount all at once. And then we talked about dollar cost averaging. Um, I think dollar cost averaging is really what most people use as they make the money, they are putting in uh, the, the money into the investments. And I, I always suggest to automate it. I, I actually, a lot of authors and experts suggest to automate it because if you just have the money come out of your bank account, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to press a button. You don't have to say, well, should I do this or should I invest? The investing is happening automatically. And once it's set up and it takes effort to stop it, then people will stick to it. So so that just on its own psychologically is, is extremely important. Uh, I was thinking about uh, how I was able to to invest and eventually reach financial independence. And I think a, a good amount of it is due to my personality where I'm able to stick to things, uh, whether it's exercise, diet, or investing. Like I am able 
to to know what is right and to keep doing it. And I am able to press that button myself as well for those people who don't trust themselves to press the button uh, every month to invest, automate it. And and I think, uh, you know, that's sort of um, what what will get you through to to your goals. Now, uh, the other thing I talked about was rebalancing, and I just want to reiterate this point uh, from uh, Tuesday. So rebalancing is if you determined uh, in your heart of hearts that uh, you're comfortable with a 70-30 split with 70% of your investments being in stock ETFs and then 30% of them being in bond ETFs. Um, and then a year goes by and now it's not 70-30 anymore. Like you were investing... I'm making this up $700 into the stock ETF every month and 300 into the bond ETF. And at the end of the year, it's not 70-30. What you do at the end of the year, usually need to do it every 12 months is fine. Every six months, if you want to, there's not much benefit doing it any more frequently. And uh, so, so think of, uh, in my example, think of the bonds kind of being your piggy bank. Uh, they're safer, but they're not going to have the performance of the stocks. And so during a, during a given year, it's not 70-30, maybe it's 80-20. The stocks outperformed the bonds that year, and now your portfolio is out of balance. So that means you're more exposed to risk than what you feel is right for you. So you sell that 10%. To get you back to 70% for the stock ETFs, and then you buy with that money, you buy bonds. So for your portfolio, you are selling uh, high and you're buying low, right? As the saying goes, uh, buy low, sell high. Um, so what you're doing is you're taking some money off the table and you're putting uh, you're putting it into the piggy bank, into the bonds. Next year, same thing, and so on. Most of most years stocks will outperform bonds but a day will come when you have uh, a market crash market correction and it's not if it is a when like they happen i told you uh, bear markets every five years or so um obviously not regular on not on a regular basis sometimes you'll get three of them in 10 years and sometimes you won't have anything for for 15 years but a day will come when there is a market uh, correction and a, and a bear market when uh, it, it drops more than 20%. And that's when you crack open a piggy bank and you rebalance the other way. And that's where money is made, is when you're buying something that just fell with the money that you sort of had on the side. Um, so it just depends on what you think the strategy is for you. Uh, some people are willing to ride these market corrections and bear markets out, and they're constantly invested in stocks because that is their risk profile. Other people will do 80-20, other people will do 50-50. It -50. uh, just depends what you're comfortable with. So that's rebalancing, and it is quite powerful. Um, so that's what I was going to suggest. Okay. Um sell when stuff is expensive buy when it's cheap um when markets go down see if you can buy more don't try to time the markets uh because you're going to be wrong but if you have some cash on the side uh then uh, you can you can use that cash uh i sort of have a level of 20 percent down um so you sort of need to determine your own strategy with uh, with that. So that's as far as we got. Uh, I don't know if that only took 10 minutes. Maybe that was optimistic. Uh, so now we're going to launch into taxes. So I'm quite tax aware. Uh, a vast majority of my money is in non-registered accounts. And so I need to be very aware of taxes. And if you're in a high tax bracket, it could be up to 50% of your investing profits uh, go to taxes, which isn't great. 
So what I would like to do here is uh, introduce the different accounts to you. Uh, if you know this, maybe, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be a refresher. If you don't, then, uh, you know, it's quite important. So, um, and then we'll look at some strategies as far as where different investment types go. So we'll talk about account types. We'll talk about the different investing vehicles. We'll talk about some strategies. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about estate planning. And if you have any questions, just type that in, please. And uh, before we go too far ahead, so we can refer back. So uh, this is a, a table that I put together. And actually, I had a meeting yesterday where somebody was telling me about his brother who said, um, the, the brother said proudly, I just bought RSPs. And the, the person who's in investing said, well, what did you buy? I bought RSPs. And that's fairly common. People don't understand that an RSP in a TFSA is an account. And <clears throat> you can put various investment vehicles uh, into uh, into the different accounts. So at the top, we have RSPs, which is your registered retirement savings plan, TFSA, which is your tax-free savings account, uh, the newly minted FHSA, the first uh, home, uh, home buyer savings account, RESPs, uh, there's a registered disability savings plan, and then you get stuff from work like Liras and, and so on. So basically, with the exception of real estate, which you can't seem to put into a TFSA and FHSA, you can put cash, you can hold mutual funds, individual stocks, individual bonds, exchange traded funds, you can hold private equity, uh, real estate investment trust, uh, resource, uh, so like gold, silver, that kind of thing. You can hold that in everything. So... Note that not every kind of investment cannot be held in, in an RSP. So investing in businesses in which you hold an interest more than 10% or higher, precious metals other than gold or silver, commodity futures, which I won't get into, private holding companies or private foreign corporations, your own debt and personal properties are non-qualified investments for an RSP uh, as well. So in real estate, you cannot hold in a TFSA and FHSA. But otherwise, just for your understanding, RSP and TFSA is an account. And into that, you can put a whole bunch of different things. So hopefully that's, that's clear. So this is sort of a grid between asset types or, or investment vehicles and account types. Um, yeah, and the TFSA and FHSA don't let you invest in land, uh, shares of private corporations, and general partnerships units. So that gets a little bit more sophisticated. So which vehicle to use when? So I'm, this would require jumping back and forth between different slides. So I'm not going to do that. So hopefully we'll kind of go through it and it'll all make sense. So which vehicle to use when? Um, so this now generally talks about uh, commissions. So if you're doing a, a lump sum investment, then, and like a big amount, then you can do individual stocks or ETFs. You'll pay that one-time investment fee, uh, that commission, and uh, that's it. So as long as you do a big enough lump sum, you're fine. Um so Cindy is asking, when there's a cash in a TFSA, does it earn any interest? Assuming it's in a, in an account that is earning interest, then yes, it earns interest. Or is it just like an account to allow you to buy something like an ETF? Um, so, okay, let me go back. So in the TFSA, uh, like in my in my brokerage account, I have a line called cash. This is when something pays me a dividend that drops in and suddenly cash goes from zero to $200 or whatever dividend I got. 
So for most brokerages, that cash probably isn't earning anything. Uh, and then in that same brokerage, I also have a TFS TFSA account where I would buy an ETF that uh, that holds stocks, for example. So that basically means you have you have a cash savings account, and then you, which which in in my example was non registered, and you have a uh, you have a TFSA account inside which you could also hold cash or GICs. And uh, you can hold ETFs or mutual funds or whatever it is. Um, if any of uh, those, just just to be extra confusing, in that TFSA, if that uh, exchange traded fund, if that paid a dividend, then that uh, that would pop uh, the the dividend money into the cash account inside the TFSA. So, uh, yeah, it, it can be confusing. It gets further confusing when banks will say you can have a savings account inside a TFSA. That's yet another thing that's different than the brokerage having cash. That's different. That is, an, that is a savings account and whatever interest it makes, uh, that interest, because it is earned within a TFSA is um, if you if you pull it out, then that doesn't uh, trigger any taxes. There's no taxes on on that interest when you pull it out. Um, so so those are all all different things inside your brokerage. Well, let me try to say this again, maybe organize it a little bit better because this is a common common question and 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 a mistake. Uh, inside a brokerage, you, you'll have a non-registered account inside which you can hold ETFs. If that ETF pays a dividend, then inside the non-registered account, you can have, uh, you, you're suddenly going to see cash when that dividend drops in. In the same brokerage, you can have a TFSA. Inside the TFSA, you can hold ETFs. When they pay a dividend, that TFSA will now show as having a couple hundred dollars of cash. Um, inside a brokerage, the cash accounts generally will not pay interest. At least I've never been paid interest. Um, a third version of this is that your bank says, hey, inside your TFSA, you can have a savings account. And that savings account will pay you a couple of percent interest. So that will appear inside your savings account, inside the TFSA at the bank. And if you pull that cash out of the TFSA, there is no taxes on it. Okay, I, I hope I, I answered that. I totally get that it's confusing. Um, okay, so switching gears slightly, uh, which vehicle to use when? So if you're doing a large purchase and your brokerage charges a one-time commission, then ETFs or stocks are fine because you'll pay your 10 bucks once on, a, on that $10,000 purchase and, uh, and you don't have to pay anything again. If you're doing monthly small purchases, then try to go for uh, something where there's no commission because if you're doing a couple of hundred dollars every month and then they charge you a $10 commission, then that's a high percentage of, of that couple of hundred dollars. Um, and so try to try to get a brokerage where they don't charge uh, commissions on stocks or if it's a, a non-commission ETFs or if they don't charge commissions on mutual funds. So figure out what you're going to be doing and then pick a brokerage. Um, pick a brokerage for that, so that, that does that with the lowest fees. Um, okay, so we had a few other questions. Uh, can you explain how private equity can be held in a TFSA? I understand the others. 
uh, yeah, so uh, private equity, uh, so this is uh, something for next week for the third session, but private equity is uh, investments directly with small companies that uh, don't want to be uh, on the stock exchange, but they still need money. So as an investor, uh, you can go to them directly and then they just establish a TFSA for you. Uh, so um, just when they set it up, for me, they set up a non-registered account. Uh, if you want to use a TFSA or an RSP, uh, most or pretty much all private equity that I recall, they always say that they're RSP or TFSA eligible. So that you just fill out forms for that. Um, Deborah says, this is getting really confusing. You have slides for this coming. Uh, I'll I'll try to talk through it. Maybe after we finish, th this is supposed to be about um, taxes, uh, really this chapter. Um, so maybe we'll, um, so, so we'll, we'll see if we get to it at the end. Maybe I'll go through it one more time. So Navdeep is asking, can you hold private equity ETFs? Uh, there are ETFs, I couldn't name one, but there are ETFs, uh, I believe, that uh, that hold private equity, mutual funds as well. Uh, you won't have to look very hard. Um, I know uh, Wealth Simple offers kind of a prepackaged vanilla investment, which internally that you'll never see holds private equity. Um, so you can do it various ways. I do it directly. Uh, well, through a salesman, but uh, like I, uh, I've, I've had like yesterday, I had a meeting with with managers that run some of the private equity investments that um, uh, that I'm in. Uh, so I'm in directly, and I get more access. If you're not really interested and you just want to write a check, then you can you can do an ETF. Uh, mutual funds also hold private equity, like I said, or uh, wealth uh, simple created sort of a wrapper investment. Um, so Navdeep is asking, is that a good, uh, I guess, better option than stocks? Um, so I'm going to get into this uh, on Tuesday in the next session. I actually compare and contrast the different types of investments. But really quickly, uh, private equity acts differently than stocks. Uh, stocks will tend to sort of flock together uh, on macro events. So wars get announced, uh, change in government, and the whole stock exchange sells off. Okay, uh, while private equity, because it does not trade on a minute by minute basis, is not affected by that. Um, it's also one company, one investment, maybe one project. So you can invest in car washes, self storage, uh, apartment buildings, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so, it, you know, my investment in in a car wash was totally unaffected when uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine, while people sold their stocks wholesale. So, uh, a private equity is just a different type of asset, and it's a good diversification. Uh, private equity is the most risky uh, asset class, uh, I would argue. Because with stocks, they have to notify you, and then you can make movements with your stocks. While with private equity, the the, the first time you know something's going wrong is when the the monthly uh, uh, payments that they make to you stop coming. Uh, so it's it's different. It's different. I I certainly wouldn't say it's better. Um, I've had a stock go to zero and I've had a private equity investment go to zero, uh, completely coincidentally, roughly for the same amount. So uh, I will talk about this on Tuesday a lot more. Um, okay. So if you're doing real estate, obviously you have to do a lump sum. You can't, you can't buy 
I mean, I guess online there's there's websites that you can do small amounts and and invest in real estate. But if you're buying a single property yourself, you can't do five hundred bucks a month kind of thing. You have to do a lump sum. Okay, so now back to taxation. Um, so let's talk about the RSP first. This is a the Canadian thing. So RSP registered retirement savings plan is bought with pre-tax dollars. So I, I kind of I was confused about this many years ago. So in case some people are confused, uh, I'll show you uh, how there's basically three synonymous ways of calling RSP. So you can either say you're buying with pre-tax dollars, or it's lowering your income, or it gives you a tax refund if you're using after-tax dollars for the purchase. So the way I explain it is, let's say your income is 60,000. So this is the first one, bought with pre-tax dollars, okay? You make a $10,000 RSP purchase. For tax purposes, your adjusted income is now $50,000. You pay a 30% taxes just to make the math easy. So you pay 15 grand in taxes and your take home is, $35,000, okay? So that was pre-tax dollars. You didn't get taxed on the $10,000 that you purchased the RSP with. Obviously, you still had to come up with the money, but to um, for, for tax purposes, you bought the RSPs with, um, with money that you don't have to pay taxes on. So pre-tax dollars. Um, lowering your income is uh, you basically made fifty thousand dollars. You you didn't make sixty, you made fifty, and then you paid the same fifteen grand in taxes, and your take home was thirty five. And then the last version is so this is kind of where you paid your taxes, and then at the end, you made an RSP purchase. So you bought with after-tax dollars, which I'll show you here, and then you got a tax refund. So this is how, how it goes. On your $60,000 throughout the year, you paid your 30%, so you actually paid $18,000 in, in taxes. Your take-home was forty two. dollars you use your take-home pay, you use after-tax dollars in this example to buy the uh, the RSPs. So the cash left was 32, but on your taxes, you got, uh, because you bought $10,000 worth of RSPs and you're in a 30% tax rate, you received a $3,000 tax refund 32 plus three still gets you to the same 35,000. So you can talk about RSPs in multiple different ways. It all works out the same. It's just whenever somebody said, oh, but but you're, you're buying it with pre-tax dollars. Well, they were talking about the leftmost one. Um, or the RSP gets subtracted out of your, out of your income. Well, that's this one. Or you know, I pay taxes all year and then I got a tax refund. So that's the third one. Okay. So I just, because that, that was confusing and I didn't really understand what that meant. I illustrated it. So now some guidelines, uh, obviously talk with your accountant, uh, but the way I always uh, frame it is use RSPs at the top of your career. I'll go through this again, kind of compare and contrast. Um, so use RSPs at the top of your career when you're in a high tax bracket to lower your taxes. You get a good bang for your RSP buck when you're making a lot of money. That's when RSPs help you with the taxes. Um, you can also use RSPs for tax inefficient investments. So what I mean by this, and we'll get into that when we get to the tax table, is uh, there's investments which get taxed 
heavily in a non-registered account. So you put them into an RRSP because anything that you pull out of an RRSP gets taxed heavily. So it, it breaks even. So I'll, I'll explain that. It, it might be a little bit clearer in the, um, in the tax table. Okay. The rule is with RSPs, they're for retirement. They were created where you're in a high tax bracket when you're putting the money in. So you get a tax benefit at the time. Then the money grows, tax deferred. And then ideally you're in a low tax bracket when you're selling the RSPs to live off in retirement. Um, you have to be in a lower tax bracket when you're selling them than when you're buying them. Otherwise, they're actually harmful when it comes to taxes. Okay. Uh, RSPs defer any taxes until you pull the money out. So you put the money in, you get a tax benefit for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, the money grows without you paying any taxes. As long as you keep the money inside the RSP, you cannot pull it out during that time for that tax deferral. But then once you pull it out, then they are taxed fully. And I'll show you on the tax table what fully means. So Peter is asking, is there a maximum you should hold in an RSP before it gets tax inefficient? So yeah. So you're right. I've I've dealt with this many times. So what what happens is at 71, <clears throat> you have to okay, Greg says he has to sign off. Um yeah, I will, like I said, I'll post it and email everybody uh, on uh, probably on Monday. I'll I'll put it on the YouTube channel and then you can have a look. Uh, thanks for coming, Greg. Uh, so, uh, Peter, um, at 71, everybody uh, 71 years old, the holder of the RSPs has to start withdrawing uh, from the RSP. It gets flipped to a RIF which stands for Registered Retirement Income uh, Fund. At 71, you have to flip it to a RIF, and then you have to start, uh, you have to start pulling the money out. Um, at 71, you have to pull 5% of your, of your RSPs. At 88, you have to pull out 10%. So uh, if you have a couple of hundred thousand dollars in your RSP, it's not really a problem because you're going to pull out 10 grand at the beginning and then it'll, it'll slowly increase to, to 20 grand. Uh, so it's, you know, that's what you want to be living on anyway. So you, you can be pulling that out. You would be pulling that out anyways. But anybody who has over a half a million and a, definitely when they're hitting a million, uh, you could argue you have a tax liability, okay? Uh, this is maybe a little bit beyond the basic scope of this, but what people can do is they can start pulling money out early. This is, uh, and you can Google this, this is called a, an RSP meltdown. So just, just Google that. But basically you start pulling money out and I plan to do this as well. Uh, is you start pulling money out at 60. You don't wait until 71 when you have to. You start pulling the money out at 60 and you're smoothing out your income that way. Okay. Uh, you don't want your income to suddenly spike because that gets you into a higher tax bracket. And I'll get into that. I think it's next slide maybe, or the slide after. It gets you into a high tax bracket. And then you're paying more taxes. So you want to smooth it out over multiple years. Um, and uh, that way you're you're in a lower tax bracket than, than you would be if you started pull, wait, waited to pull it out at 71. So that's one method. There's a few other methods. They have their pluses and minuses, and I won't get into them, but just being aware that you have a tax liability in an RRSP. Um, there's, there's accountants and financial advisors that make their living 
by by scaring people saying everybody has a tax liability if you have a couple of hundred thousand in your rsp that's just you know icing on the cake if you have a pension and cpp and old age security uh so that's not really an issue uh but if you have 500,000 or a million and and I've run into folks who who did and they are quite concerned and I mean rightly so it's a nice problem to have so I, I hope I, I explain that uh but yeah with RSPs it's um uh it's uh, it, it gets taxed fully and I'll I'll show show you what that means so uh, so Peter says, having said that about the RSP, the TFSA would be a great option to keep as much in. Uh, yeah, so TFSA is tax efficient, and it also does not, uh, money you pull out of the TFSA also does not get uh, considered when you're looking at uh, old age security clawback. If you're making too much money, the TFSA does not get included in that. So TFSA has all sorts of uh, great things. The only thing is, um, unless you invested in something super risky that rocketed up, usually people don't have that much in the TFSA because of the limits, right? We're at 95,000 total limit. You know, I, I invested in index ETFs in my TFSA and it's like 165. Um, so, well, NVIDIA would be one. If you timed Bitcoin right would be another. If you bought small cap, something or other and it you know if if it was junior miners for example and they found whatever they were looking for and it it went times 100 then uh yeah if you had that in RSP then that would be concerning because you're going to have to pay taxes on all of it uh if you had it in a TFSA then you're laughing uh which actually will be something I'll I'll explain that TFSA is for long shots um or at least the way I think of it, um, but RSPs give you the the tax relief. So if you are in that situation when you're putting money in, and like in your forties, if you peaked in your career, um, that's that's when RSP should be your bread and butter. Uh, so when you make a purchase in an RSP, the limit is used up. Uh, and everybody has, um, I want to say it's like 24,000 a year or, or 18% of your previous, um, uh, of your previous year's income. That's your uh, current year's limit, whichever is lower. So, I mean, it, it can be quite hefty still. Like if you make a lot of money, you can still get 18% of your previous uh, of your previous year's income as your RSP limit. So that's where a lot of people uh, have their retirement. It's just the government will eventually get its taxes. It's basically encouraging you to save for your own retirement uh, so they don't have to feed you or you're not living under a bridge. So that's the point. Uh, the other thing is that maybe not everybody knows about is that you can buy the RSPs now, but you don't take the tax benefits until later. So the money starts growing. And if you do have the money, you can uh, you can start buying RSPs, but you only start using the benefit to lower your salary or your income later when you're in a higher tax bracket. So if you are fresh out of school, uh, this is something you could um, you could do, right? If you have the spare cash, uh, start you can start buying RSPs, uh, but just not uh, not use the the tax benefit until you're in a high higher tax bracket. I would I would argue pretty much everybody is the year that they buy the RSPs they will they will use the um, they will use the tax benefit. Okay, so TFSA, that's sort of the inverse of the uh, of the RRSP. So TFSA is bought with after-tax dollars. What that means is there is no tax benefit when you're putting the money into the TFSA. 
uh, you pay taxes on the money, basically, you know, your paycheck, they took the taxes off, whatever you get in your pocket, that's what you're buying the TFSA with. There is no um, subtraction from your income when you buy TFSA. The, the nice thing is anything withdrawn out of the TFSA is tax-free. And unlike the RRSP, the limit for your TFSA recycles January 1st, the following year. So if I, uh, if I withdrew $10,000 in 2023, on January 1st, I get that $10,000 for my TFSA limit plus the fresh $7,000, which we got for 2024. Uh, RRSPs do not recycle. Uh, TFSA limit does, which is uh, very cool. Um, again, it, it is limited, um, but it is what it is. And uh, TFSA, uh, I, I think between these two accounts, uh, there's a lot of financial advisors who have a favorite and that it, it really should be individual. It really should be individual. And I'll talk about that. So, uh, so Peter says any capital gain in a TFSA is also tax-free. Yes. Inside the TFSA, um, any growth, there's no taxes on it. When you pull money out of a TFSA, there is no taxable event when you pull the money out. There is no taxes when you pull the money. Okay. Uh, so you pay taxes up front on anything going into the TFSA, but after that it is tax free. There's one slight exception, which which I'll I'll mention, but it, it is a detail. Uh, so I would suggest use a TFSA if you're starting your career. You're still in a low tax bracket, so it's not efficient to use up the RSP room. And the low taxes that you're paying on your income make it cheap to get the after-tax money to put into the TFSA. So if I were just fresh out of school, I'm starting my first job, TFSA would be where I would be putting my money. And if I had extra cash, I would be uh, buying RRSPs as well, start the compounding, start the tax deferral on the RRSP, but not use it. Uh, to get, um, I would not use it uh, for the tax benefit because I'll get a bigger bang for my buck later, okay? Um, you would also want to use the TFSA for tax inefficient investments. So examples include uh, savings uh, accounts, interest, uh, bond interest, basically anything that, that pays interest. Uh, because there's no taxes on anything coming out of the, the TFSA, tax inefficient stuff is good. Or as I had mentioned earlier, long shots. Uh, the um, Because if, if your investment goes times 10, times 100, not paying taxes on it is is amazing. Uh, so Cindy says, if you've never put money into a TFSA, is there room to put more than this year's 7,000 limit? Like there's more room for all the past years when the TFSA started. Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I believe after 18, you start accumulating, after 18 years old, you start accumulating TFSA room. Uh, it started out, I think, at 5,000 a year. Uh, we are now at 7,000, but if you've never used the TFSA and you've accumulated, uh, since what was it like 2006, give or take when, uh, when the, uh, the TFSA was introduced, if you've never invested into it, uh, and you were over 18 during that whole time, then you would have the, uh, the 95,000 limit. So you could, tomorrow you can go and uh, establish a TFSA account and then put the entire $95,000 into it all, all at once, let it grow. And then when the money comes out, there's no taxes on it. 
when it when it leaves the TFSA. Yeah, absolutely. You accumulate the limit and you can use previous year's uh, unused limit. Um, same for RSP for that matter. Uh, if you hadn't, if you accumulated limit by earning a salary, but not using it for an RSP, uh, it all adds up. Like at one point I had a couple of hundred thousand dollars of RSP limit. Uh, so Peter says you can find your TFSA total limit on the CRA website uh, under my account. So the CRA website, uh, I remember having to to apply for a login and then they would send me a paper login. I don't know if they're still doing that. So it was a bit of a hassle to get uh, uh, an account. You definitely should get one. There's all sorts of interesting stuff, including CPP and, and OAS on there. Uh, so you should definitely look at the CRA website and, and get a login. Uh, what I will say, however, is that the um, the limits for the RSP and the TFSA are like 18 months behind. Like they're, oh, you can do it online now? Okay, cool. Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, I established mine like a decade ago and they, they sent me, they sent me my password by mail by snail mail, by paper. Um, so yeah, double check, uh, Cindy, double check your TFSA limit on the CRA website. Uh, but once you start putting money into it, I would very much encourage you to do like even amounts, you know, do 5,000, 10,000, whatever, um, and track it yourself. Because if you go and look, it won't be updated. Like I looked and I'm like, that doesn't look right. Like I, I know I invested more than that. Like my limits, the, the limits are guaranteed to change on January 1st when you get the fresh 7,000. I would argue it, it probably takes them at least a year to update it for any um, any fresh limit uh, that you uh, that recycled uh, on January 1st. Um. Like they do get the information, it just doesn't get included right away. So a uh, pinch of salt, I guess, on, on the numbers you see on the CRA website. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the third account that I'm sort of going to cover here is the non-registered or cash account. Okay, Deborah says that they were 19,000 behind uh, behind uh, on her limit number. Yeah, it, it just maybe the institutions don't send the information right away, uh, but track it yourself, track it yourself. Uh, so like what I do is I have an automated 500 every month. So five times 12 is, uh, that's the 6,000. And then I will put in a lump sum January 2nd for whatever the difference is between the 6,000 and the current limit. So, you know, our limits got raised to 7,000. So I put in a, an extra 1,000 on January 2nd. And then for the rest of the year, I just have the 500 going. So that way I know I'm not going to over contribute. Never, ever, ever over contribute to either RSP or TFSA. They will charge you a harsh, harsh uh, penalty interest until you pull the money out. Um, if you do it by accident, phone them, apologize profusely, pull the money out right away um, and get get it back to where it needs to be. Otherwise, they charge you interest like 1% per month, so 12% annually. Whatever investments you have would be hard-pressed to beat that. Um, so don't over-contribute. Okay, uh, great questions, by the way. So the third type of account we'll talk about is the uh, non-registered or cash account. Cash just means it's not registered. Don't confuse it with actual cash, whether in a savings account or in a brokerage, like I talked about you know, a half hour ago where dividends drop in and now you have cash. Sometimes people will call it a cash account. I'm going to call it non-registered from here on out just to avoid confusion. 
Um, so you could use non-registered accounts if you're starting your career, if your TFSA has been exhausted and you're still in a low tax bracket. Uh, so it's not efficient to use up RSP room yet. Um, the low taxes make it cheap to get after-tax money, so you're not being taxed very much on your salary if you're uh, kind of at the beginning of your career. So you can put money into the non-registered account. Uh, I would say use the TFSA first. If you've filled up the TFSA, then you could go to non-registered. Uh, you could also argue do TFSA, then the RRSP without using the tax benefit. If you've exhausted both your TFSA and RRSP and you still have money at the beginning of your, of your career, then you know, you're know you living at home and your mom's cooking for you. Um, if you still have money, then it should go into non-registered. So I hope that all makes sense. Uh, non-registered account is bought with after-tax dollars. So you've paid taxes on, on the money that you're using to invest. Um, anything withdrawn is taxed for capital gains. Uh, it's tax efficient because only half of the capital gain is taxable. And I'll show you that on the, on the tax table. I think it's next slide. And it is added to your income and then taxed at your marginal rate. So I'll, I'll show you the, the columns. Um, the thing is only the appreciation is taxed. So what I mean by that is you've, you went to work, you earned a salary, you pay taxes on a salary, you got some money, you invested that money. Let's say you invested $10,000 that you've paid taxes on already. It came out of your pocket. And it went up to 12,000. So if you sell that 12,000, you're only going to pay taxes on half of the 2,000. Okay. So sometimes you, you look at your portfolio and you're like, oh, I, I have a lot of money. I'm going to pay a lot of taxes. Well, it depends in a non registered account how much money you actually put in you'll only pay taxes on the difference between what it is currently and what you put in. So, um, yeah, because you already paid taxes uh, on your salary to get the money to put in in the first place. Okay. Um, dividends that, if you have stocks, of course, dividends are taxed very low if they're the uh, the right dividends, meaning Canadian eligible dividends, which is uh, generally publicly traded companies, uh, generally based in Canada. Um, they will generally, but not always pay Canadian eligible dividends. So those are taxed very low in non-registered, which I'll show you. Uh, through to very high taxes. So foreign dividends uh, get taxed basically like your salary. Uh, so will interest, by the way. Whoop. Uh, the other superpower that only this account has is that if you lost money, if you have capital losses, then you can use those capital losses to offset or lower other non-registered gains. So this is uh, in a non-registered account. If you have one stock that made a lot of money and you sell it, and then you have another stock that lost money and you sort of lost faith in it and you sell that, the losses from the stock that went down will uh, get subtracted from the gains uh, that the stock that made money. Uh, so uh, that's called tax loss selling. And um, uh, it, that is a, a legitimate uh, tax prevention technique. And it's done in December uh, by, by everybody who has the chance. You can sort of, uh, you can harvest those losses 
to give you a benefit now. Um, I won't go into it too much, but just uh, understand there's there's a few other rules about it, and a non-registered account is the only one that has the superpower. Uh, so Peter says, is it true that Canadians can earn up to fifty thousand per year tax free in Canadian? And and the key word you're missing there, Peter, is Canadian eligible dividend payers. And the the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. That's that's one of the other things you have to be a Canadian in order. Well, obviously you're doing Canadian taxes. Uh, you have to be a Canadian to uh, to take advantage of that. So is is the tax table next? Nope, not yet. So here's a bit of a summary, the cheat sheet, if you will. I, I have a, in previous presentations, I sort of went back and forth with the tax table to illustrate my points. And I'm just going to go in sequence. And once we get to the tax table, we'll we'll summarize everything. So here's, here's a cheat sheet. So bonds pay interest. Uh, put bonds into either an RSP or a TFSA. Inside the RSP, the, the interest doesn't get taxed. When you pull the money out of the RSP, it would get taxed the same as the bond interest would in a non-registered account. So it makes no difference. So if you want to use an RSP, and you want to have bonds doesn't mean you should i'm just saying if you want to uh it's part of your if it's part of your risk profile then put bonds into an rsp because bond interest is taxed tax inefficiently in a non-registered account uh so don't don't have bonds in a non-registered account or put them into a tfsa where it, I would argue it's a bit of a waste of TFSA room, but put them in there uh, because there's no taxes on on them at all uh, on anything that comes out of the TFSA. Uh, put any foreign dividend payers. So this is this is the little thing uh, I was going to mention. Uh, foreign dividend payers have at least a 15% withholding tax on dividends, on dividends. So if your investment pays, you know, a 4% a, a uh, dividend, then before the money drops into your account, whether it's RSP, uh, sorry, whether it's TFSA or uh, non-registered, they uh, the the brokerage will pull fifteen percent of that four percent, so they'll pull 0.6 of a percent, and they'll never give it to you. Okay, and you can see it on your statement. Um, so that that fifteen percent withholding happens in a TFSA. It happens in a non-registered account. Uh, but you can get it back at tax time. You'll get a tax credit for the 15% of the dividend that got deducted. In an RRSP, there will not be any withholding. So American stocks will have the 15% withholding in a TFSA or non-registered, uh, but will not have it in, a, in an RRSP. Um, other country stocks uh, could be worse. It depends on the tax treaty. So generally, foreign dividend payers automatically RRSP. Okay, As, and I've sort of been saying about stocks, but if you have an ETF with foreign dividend payers, then same rule applies. Uh, use a non-registered account if the TFSA is exhausted or if you're expecting losses. Remember, the you can use the capital losses to, to offset the capital gains and only offset capital gains like it can't uh, capital losses cannot offset your salary for example um but i, I had a question about this uh, a little while ago if you if you sold an investment property like a house and it it appreciated that also counts as capital gains so if you had some stocks you wanted to get rid of anyways that were losers and you didn't expect them to recover then those capital losses will offset the capital gains from that house that you that you're selling 
So, um, so you use a TFSA first until it's exhausted, then go to non-registered. I mean, if you expect losses, then use a non-registered, but who would actually invest in something that they were expecting losses on? Um, so TFSA will otherwise always beat non-registered. So that's that's sort of another guideline. Um, RSP will beat a TFSA from a tax point of view if you're selling the RSP in a lower tax bracket than when you're buying. So if you're using the RSP appropriately when you're putting money into it, when you're in a high tax bracket and you're pulling money out uh, when you're in a low tax bracket, the RSP will, will beat a TFSA. Uh, TFSA equals RSP if you buy and sell in the same tax bracket. If you're ignoring the fact that for the TFSA, you had to pay the taxes early to, to be able to put the money into the TFSA in the first place, while with the RSP, you pay them later. This could be significant if you pay, uh, if you keep the, the money in the RSP for 40 years, like there's there's a time value of money. Okay, uh, two, 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 couple of questions. So Chris is asking, is that for rental property or primary residence? So that uh, when I was talking about uh, capital gains, that was specifically and only on a rental investment property. There's no taxes on your primary residence. If your primary residence goes down in value, nobody will give you anything for it. If it goes up in value, which I guess we're generally expecting, but not always, if it goes up in value, you don't pay any taxes on the primary residence. So I was talking about investment properties, rental properties. Uh, Jimmy Frank says, if my TSFSA is full, good for you. I could use my non-reg and receive U.S. dividends and get the 15% uh, dividend withholding when filing your taxes. Yes. Yeah. Your accountant will have to do it. Uh, I always just give the T slips and and the uh, statements where they can see like on on my brokerage, uh, like even just looking at the transactions in my brokerage online, you can see that they they you can see the negatives where they give you you know hundred uh, they they give you eighty five dollars and uh, they show minus fifteen that they they took off the um, the fifteen percent off the uh, the hundred dollar dividend and they just give you 85. Um, yeah, so you have to do your your taxes so you I mean you get it you get it back as a tax credit. Uh, TFSA will beat RSP if you're if you're selling in a higher tax bracket than you're buying. Uh, yeah, RSPs, absolutely. If if you have any doubt that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you're pulling the money out than when you're putting it in, RSPs are, are really bad. You just get the tax deferral that you don't pay taxes on it um, now. You'll pay taxes on it later when you withdraw it, but you definitely need to be in a lower tax bracket when you're pulling the money out of the RSP. Uh, so even non-registered can beat an RSP if you're in a higher tax bracket when you're uh, selling than you, when you're buying, um, especially if you had capital gains because of the 50 per, only 50% of the capital gains being recognized. So even non-registered will beat an RSP if you misuse the RSP. Uh, and then we have the, the new for 2023, the first home savings account. This is this is quite powerful. It's treated as an RSP when it's being purchased and as a TFSA if it's being withdrawn for the first home purchase. The limit isn't anything to write home about, 8,000 times five, so 40 grand. Like that's in, in Vancouver, that's nowhere near a down payment uh, on, on, on anything. But uh, if you are eligible for it, if you haven't owned a home within the last four years, uh, definitely sign up for it. Sign up for the FHSA. Because even if you don't use the money for a first 
time home purchase, uh, you will, you're at least creating more RRSP room for yourself. So there's no downside if you're eligible for uh, an FHSA to, uh, to set one up, to set one up. And of course, the money's growing and they're tax deferred as well. So there is that. Okay, I, I hope that's clear. If you're eligible for it, get it. There's no downside. At, at worst, you'll you'll have extra RRSP room. If you and your spouse are renting right now, both of you go and go and grab an FHSA. Oh, there's more. Okay, uh, students should be investing in a TFSA or non-registered, not RSPs. I'll say with the caveat that if if you're one of those disciplined people who disciplined people who could put money into the RSP and not use uh, use the tax benefit that year and save it for later when you're in a higher tax bracket, then use an RSP if you are one of those. Uh, otherwise, TFSA is first and then drift into non-registered after you've maxed out your TFSA. Uh, RSPs will be for interest-bearing investments and foreign dividend payers. Everything is tax inefficient uh, coming out of the RSP, so put tax inefficient things into it. I, I hope that makes sense. TFSA put growth or interest-bearing investments, tax and efficient stuff, but don't put foreign dividend payers into a TFSA because of that 15% of um, withholding on dividends. It's not a huge amount. Let's, you know, let's be real. But if if you can structure your accounts and your investments appropriately, why not? Especially if you're going to be doing something for the next 20 years. Uh, Non-registered uh, put Canadian dividend payers because they're going to be taxed uh, as Canadian eligible dividends, and I'll show that to you. Um, or put high volatility stuff where you could have losses, and then you can use the write-off. But of course, nobody's expecting it. You use the write-off if it happens. Nobody is investing with the write-off in mind, because if you think it's going to go down, then don't buy it in, a, in any account. So I hope that makes sense. Please, please ask me to repeat if, like, I know this is a lot. Uh, it's, if you're going to automate something and do something for the next 20 years, like I said, inform yourself. There's articles written about this, read this and get it straight so you're doing the right thing you, the the counter argument is well just start investing don't worry about the account yeah maybe you're not doing it perfectly tax efficient but at least you're starting and I'll, i usually say well do it properly if you can so peter says foreign stocks non-dividend payers are okay to hold in a tfsa yes so Yes. So what I what I do is um, both in my non-registered and in in a in a TFSA, I try to go for non-dividend payers, uh, and they're, they're fine in a TFSA. the The thing is, if they're not paying dividends, then that means you're you're expecting capital gains, and capital gains in a non-registered get taxed at half in a tfsa they don't get taxed at all so if you have tfsa room then fill up the tfsa first uh, but if you don't then uh, non-dividend payers are still okay in a non-registered account as well um, and so yeah i look for foreign dividend foreign non-dividend payers as you say peter uh, chris says could you please explain the the line RSP interest bearing RSP interest bearing? Sure, yeah. So into your RSP, put interest bearing investments. Interest in a non registered account gets taxed heavily. Okay, anything coming out of an RSP also gets taxed exactly the same heavily. So 
if I if I want to get the tax benefit by putting money into an RRSP and I really want to have something safe that pays dividend, sorry, that pays interest, that pays so like bonds or even uh, GICs or term deposits, and I I want that in my RRSP, then it's fine because anything coming out of an RRSP gets taxed the same as that interest would have been. Uh, uh, would have been when you got that interest in a non-registered account. So that's the first phrase, okay? Foreign dividend payers uh, are okay to have in a non-registered. Uh, don't have them because you'll you'll there will be that 15% withholding from the dividends, but then you'll get it back at tax time for, for a non-registered account. In an RSP, that 15% withholding will not happen at all. So um, that's in a tax treaty because RSP is a uh, uh, is a um, uh, uh, retirement account, right? Uh, so that uh, that is an exception. Now, in a just just extra wrinkle, maybe an extra information. In a non-registered account, foreign dividends, though, get taxed, whatever is left after the 15% withholding, that gets taxed as if it were salary. It's foreign dividend payers are very inefficient from a tax point of view. Um, so I, uh, if I want to have an RSP and get the tax benefit that the RSP gives me, I will put those foreign dividend payers into the RRSP, knowing that when I pull the money out of the RRSP in 20 years, it's going to get taxed heavily, just like those foreign dividends would get taxed in my non-registered account today. So in the, in the RRSP, when you're pulling money out, everything is tax inefficient. Uh, so you might as well put tax inefficient stuff into the RRSP. It, it'll it'll work out exactly the same. Okay. I I think uh, if you do a little bit more reading on it, it it becomes a little bit clearer. Um, it it's a lot to take in first time through. Um, so Peter's asking. Is it true that you should be careful not to use your self-directed brokerage account for day trading? Uh, partly. So uh, day trading, like we talked about last session, is when you buy something uh, in the morning and then you sell it the same day, if you sell it in the afternoon. Uh, to me, it's speculative or at best gambling, but uh peter the distinction is it's okay in a self-directed brokerage account that's non-registered that's fine you'll pay taxes on it they don't mind rsp fine you'll pay taxes on it when you pull the money out no problem where they don't want you to be day trading is in the tfsa because there's no taxes on it and that's supposed to be an investment. It's supposed to be kind of a longer term uh, account and they don't like that. So uh, I'm not sure exactly where the line is. I'm sure it's a checklist and depending on what you're doing, you know, um, in my TFSA, I'm only buying or like once a couple of years, I'll sell something and, and I'll buy something else right away within the TFSA. But if somebody is buying and selling on a daily basis, that that could get taxed either for capital gains if they made money, or they the CRA could even argue that you're running a business, and therefore they're going to treat any uh, any gains as salary. So we'll, so capital gains only half of them would get taxed, while if they say you're running a business, this is what this is your job, then they will tax it fully, even though you had it in a TFSA account. 
so that's uh, that's where you run afoul of the CRA in if you're day trading. Okay, Chris says, thanks, you're welcome. Peter says, my account says that having a few months between the buy and the sell is a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I don't know where the line is. I think it's it's a sort of a gray area sliding scale. Uh, I would say it, just totally, totally speculating. If uh, you have a regular job and then you buy something and you sell something once a week, that they would probably let you go, that they're like, yeah, that's that's not um, that's not his job. They might argue for the capital gains to be charged, but they're not gonna they're not gonna tax you as if you were making salary. But if you're not doing anything else, then uh, yeah, uh, that that would be that could be bad. A few months, I I would say would be safe. Probably even buy and sell once a month, you'd probably still be okay. Uh, remember, it's the selling, right? Like if you just keep buying, there's no problem. You could buy on a daily basis; nobody would care. It's the uh, it's the selling. Uh, Jimmy says, in my non-reg account, foreign dividends are taxed fully, just like interest. Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Canadian eligible dividends are very tax friendly, and I'm sure I'm going to get to the tax table anytime now. Uh, while uh, interest um, and foreign dividends are taxed brutally. And of course, in the non-reg, you also get that 15% withholding, but you do get that back at tax time. Um, okay, so I think we were up to date with that. Cool, cool, great questions, guys. Uh, okay, so as a strategy, uh, so, Red is is your uh, salary, your income from your job. So when you're first starting out, TFSA is where you want to be. If you've maxed out the TFSA, use non-registered or possibly use RRSPs, but don't take the tax benefit. Just start investing in the RRSP and save your the tax benefit for when you're in a higher tax bracket. Some people say, 50 grand a year is where the cutoff is between TFSA and RSP. If you're making less than 50 grand, use TFSA. If you're making more, use RSPs. I try to add a little bit of nuance to that. Say, if for you, if you don't think you're going to make much more money than, you know, the usual inflation adjustments, like if you're sort of at the peak of your career, RSPs are it. Whether you're making... 70 grand or 270 grand RSPs are it because you're sort of at the peak of your career. Uh, and that's where you're going to get the best bang for your RSP buck from a tax point of view that you're going to get. Okay. Um, I had a friend of mine who was making a lot of money and he was sort of in his peak earning years and he went to a financial advisor and he had a financial advisor put him into a TFSA which I mean, at least my friend started investing, but the that was the wrong account. Um, now the the point is when you retire, and I mean you don't have to have a straight drop down. You could you could ease out of it on a diagonal, but you need to start withdrawing from the RSP uh, when you're making less money than when you were putting it in. Right, that was the key. Or, that that was the key for. <clears throat> for the RRSP. Okay, tax table. I know I've been promising this. This is the exciting part. So a couple of things to think about uh, as we look at it. Other income is taxed the highest. And so it'll be a column called other income. It includes taxes on earned interest. So we were talking about interest being not tax efficient. RSP benefits and withdrawals are also taxed in that column and the foreign dividends that we were talking about in non-registered accounts. For eligible dividends, I think this is to Peter's previous point, you can pull 50,000 basically tax-free if you have no other income, depending on your province. 
uh, depending on your conspiracy theory level, the tax table caters to investors. Uh, it caters to rich people. It really harms workers and savers just because uh, because of the way it's structured. Uh, you could argue investors employ others, they run businesses and so on. Uh, so that's why it's giving them a tax benefit. Somebody who took a risk um, is is given lower taxes. But if you're getting paid salary, I, I know it's unavoidable, but you, taxes are not your friend. Uh, the Canadian eligible dividends we talked about earlier uh, are creating a home bias where they're encouraging us to buy Canadian stock investments. So we'll we'll talk about that. Okay, so this is, uh, I'll, I'll explain everything. So this is for 2023. Uh, there's a new one for 2024, obviously. This is, uh, this is from uh, taxtips.ca. You can find the same table for your, for 2024 and for your own uh, province. Uh, this combines federal and the provincial tax brackets and tax rates. Um, for 2024, I had a quick look and these numbers stayed the same. The only thing that happened was the tax brackets shifted. So when I'm talking about tax brackets, I'm talking about this column. And these numbers, uh, we have to be perfectly clear here, and you have to understand this. These are marginal tax rates. And what marginal means here is uh, if, if I'm already, if, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't highlight it. So if I'm in, in the fourth tax bracket, if I'm making already, this is the important point, if I'm already making $95,000 and I make one more dollar, I pay 31 cents in taxes on that $1. The 31% is not, I repeat, is not on everything that I made. The first 45,000 in British Columbia is taxed at 20%. The next 8,000 is, is taxed at 22. It's incremental, like no, you, you'd be shocked how many people think that if they make one more dollar that's and they get into the next tax bracket that they pay the higher taxes on all of their income. Like nobody would try to get ahead in life. You know what I mean? Uh, my father thought that, multiple people I've talked to thought that. That's not how it works. It's marginal for one more dollar. That's how much you pay. If you're making 95 grand in BC in salary or wages or interest, or foreign dividends, that's all in, in non-registered. That's <laughs> Cindy, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> Cindy, don't, don't tell us. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just poking fun. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm working for a living and I'm making 95 grand, my average tax rate, just eyeballing it, is probably 23% maybe. There's calculators out there that, that if, if you're really interested. Your average tax rate is thirty is twenty three percent, give or take. Just I, I kind of eyeballed it. Okay, it's not thirty one just because you got up there. Um. So. So the more money you make, the higher taxes you make on the additional money that you're making. So when I'm talking about getting a good bang. <laughs> Cindy, uh, if if I'm talking about getting a big, uh, better bang for your RSP dollar in the higher tax brackets, what I mean is if you're making in salary over a quarter of a million dollars and you buy RSPs, the first RSPs will, will give you a 53.5% uh, tax benefit. And then as you're uh, as you go down into into the the lower tax brackets, then you get less and less of a tax benefit. You know, uh, uh, depending on how much money you were making. Once you get into the second last tax bracket, by buying more and more RSPs, now you're um, 
uh, now you're getting a 49% tax benefit and then you're getting a 46 and then 44 and, and so on, right? So if, you, if you're making 50 grand today and you're at the beginning of your career spending RSP room to get a 22% tax benefit when you could save it for later when you could get a 40% tax benefit you know, it doesn't make sense if if you know you're going to make more money later. Okay. So RSPs, you get your benefit in this other income column. When you pull the money out, you get taxed in, in this other income column as well. And in non-registered accounts, if you get foreign dividends, they are taxed here as well. Okay, so capital gains only happen in non-registered accounts once again. Yeah, Peter says it would be nice to make over 240K. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, interestingly enough, I would argue that anybody making over 100 grand would probably be a contractor and be incorporated, but I'm told that there's lots of people who who make huge amounts of money uh, in salary and and are just getting killed by taxes. So, you know, if you, if you if your company won't let you be a contractor and be incorporated, uh you're you're paying the taxes. You if you make more money, you're still bringing half of it home or almost, but you know, you're you're definitely getting getting beat up by taxes. So in a non-registered account, if your assets appreciate, you get capital gains. Uh, you'll notice it's always half of the other income column. So whether you say so if you're in the uh, if you're in the hundred and thirty thousand tax bracket already, and then you sell some stock that you made money on, you could say, well, uh, Either for all of the stock, I pay 20% or for half of the stock, I pay 40%. It, it works. Obviously, the math is the same. So capital gains in non-registered accounts are taxed favorably because they're taxed. Only half of it is taxed. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Now we move on to my favorite, dividends. So I constructed, as I mentioned uh, before, just by virtue of running out of RSP and TFSA room, uh, most of my money is is non-registered, and I invested heavily in uh, Canadian eligible dividend payers. So that's this eligible uh, column. And uh, as Peter mentioned earlier, for the first fifty thousand, uh, give or take, depends on the province. Uh, you're basically not paying any any taxes. If you have no other income. Now note, if you have a salary and then you get dividends, that they add up together and puts you into a higher tax bracket and you pay on everything there. Just to be clear, okay? But if you have if you have $100,000 worth of uh Canadian eligible dividends, your average tax rate is what? 3%, 4%? Because you had negatives on the first half of it, and then you had one and five percent on on the second half of it. So this is really structured for people to invest Canadian uh, and to to invest, right? Um, Non-eligible Canadian dividends. Uh, the only example I can think of is if you have your own corporation and you pay yourself. And I'm not going to get into it too much, but you can pay yourself either salary where you will get taxed in the other income, or you can pay yourself non-eligible dividends because your corporation is not, um, it's not publicly traded. So it, it doesn't pay Canadian eligible dividends directly. Okay. So for my, uh, for my, uh, hopefully the rest of my life, I'm going to be paying just a couple of percentage points. Uh, 
because if I don't sell anything, then uh, I just keep paying the paying the taxes on the dividends, and I just keep getting the dividends. If I do sell something, then I pay the capital gains, which is still not too too bad. So uh, I'm a little bit behind with the comments. So Peter says, can you show us your favorite dividend payers? Uh, yeah, like I'm pretty much uh, into the Canadian big banks. Uh, not that I'm suggesting them, I'm just this is what I have. Uh, you can look on canadianmoneytalk.ca. You can go and, and I actually post my portfolio every month. Uh, it's just a, a printout out of my uh, Quicken tracking software. Uh, so you can look exactly what I have and how much I have if you're interested. Uh, it's what works for me. Uh, remember, we talked about risk profile and what you want out of your portfolio. I want cash flow out of my portfolio. I, I want some growth. And that's where I have the, uh, the non-dividend payers uh, and like for foreign um for foreign uh stocks so that's where i get the growth um or through mutual funds or etfs uh, but for the dividend payers in canada we're quite limited we basically have oil companies which pay uh nice dividends these days and we have the financials and that's it um I know the Canadian banks will never ever cut their dividends because they haven't for literally a century. So I feel pretty secure with that. Uh, and and they, pay, they pay very nice dividends. Again, this is right for me. Please do your own research. Uh, Jimmy says, are there ETFs made of Canadian eligible dividends? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, Canadian, uh, you can look for dividend, uh, Canadian dividend aristocrats. So these are uh, ETFs that hold within them uh, Canadian dividend payers. Uh, and uh, the aristocrat part means that they've been increasing the uh, the payments uh, of the dividend. They've been increasing the dividends for at least the five years in a row. So that's what makes them aristocrats. Okay. So it, the tax table, I think, is important because it's not what you make, it's what you get to keep. So just be very careful of that. Okay, uh, so government pensions, estate planning, tax strategies. So I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you guys can see that, but use RSP meltdown, taking the RSPs out before 71. If you have a significant over half a million RSP to avoid being forced to take out larger amounts at 71. Registered accounts are otherwise usually spent last to keep tax deferred growth go going. So what that means is registered accounts, especially RSPs where the limit does not recycle, um, uh, you wanna keep the RSPs as long as you can without withdrawing from them until you're forced to at 71. Uh, if you have a lot of RSPs as I discussed previously, then start taking them out early. Uh, Peter says, uh, what is the difference between dividend aristocrats and dividend kings? So there's a there's a significant difference, and I don't know why, in, in the naming uh, between the US and Canada. So in Canada, we have dividend aristocrats, and that just means five years. In the US, they have dividend aristocrats, and I think that means at least 10. And then there's there's dividend princes or something and that means 20 and kings are like 50 or 30 or something like that you'd have to google it but everybody sort of has their own definition of it dividend kings is an american thing uh i guess short answer uh government pensions so old age security uh, cpp they are adjusted for inflation so that's a good thing uh, we got old age security. It has a clawback when uh, your your full income is over 86, 87,000 in 2023. And it's completely clawed back when your income is 142 in, in 2023. These numbers get adjusted for uh, inflation as well, obviously. 
Uh, but if you're making too much money, uh, old age security uh, is clawed back. The government uh, provides it, uh, obviously out of our tax dollars. So you're not entitled to it if you make too much money. Uh, TFSA, as I had mentioned earlier, if you have if you pull money out of it, that does not get added to your income. So pulling money out of your TFSA does not affect the old age security clawback. RSPs and everything else does. That gets all added in. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, the Canadian eligible dividends, which I, I keep talking about, uh, they get uh, something called grossed up. They get multiplied. Uh, so they're actually higher for the purposes of uh, old age security clawback by 38%. So like I'm, I'm actually not expecting to ever see any old age security. Um, so you can take uh, CPP, Canada Pension Plan, that you have been paying into, presumably, through your job. Uh, they've been taking it out of your salary, uh, and then uh, you pay half, and then your employer pays half. If you're self self-employed, you pay both halves, obviously. Uh, you can start taking it early uh, at uh, 60, uh, then you get less by about 30%, give or take. On time, 65, or you can take it late. If you take it late, then you get more. Then you start gaining 8.4% for each year that you take it late or proportional if you part of a year. Uh, you can take old age security at 65 or you can take it late. And if you take it late, again, you start gaining 7.2%. So general guideline, uh, take CPP and old age security late if you don't need the money early and there is some amount of longevity in your family. So if you have you know, an aunt who lived till 95 and an uncle who made it to 88, uh, take everything at 70, you'll get higher payments and you'll still get a, a decent number of payments. Uh, on the flip side, if you know, everybody in your family died in their 70s, then take it at 60. Because if you wait till 70, then you're not going to get very many payments, even though you're going to get higher amounts. Um, on that uh, uh, Canada.ca website, you can get information about your CPP and old age security if you started taking it now. Uh, for CPP, there's some complicated formulas they, they throw out. Uh, the your eight worst years and and that kind of thing um it's it's still not a huge amount of money anyways uh, if you add maxed out cpp which most people don't max it out and uh, old age security which maxes out if you've lived in canada for 40 years um then i think you in 2023, it came to about 18,000 or, or 20,000 or so. But people don't max out the CPP. Uh, they do max out the old age security frequently. Uh, so estate planning, uh, just some thoughts. This is, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't something to, to act on. Uh, but keep significant assets in trusts. Uh, you will be paying accounting fees but then the assets get taxed in the hands of the beneficiary. So if you know you, you're you going to be fine and you're going to buy, you know, your 15th, uh, uh, 15th investment property, then put it into a trust for your children. So that way uh, it doesn't get taxed uh, when you're trying to transfer it to them or when you pass away. It's it's already theirs, but with the trust, you can limit access. You can uh, limit them from selling it, that kind of thing. Uh, Jimmy says, if someone's income is over 100K, is the Canadian dividends income in the non-reg account taxed at the normal tax rate or the rate you showed earlier? Yeah, the rate I showed earlier. Um, it's I'm not going to go back up there because I'd lose my place, but... Uh, Okay, 
well, let me let me go back up there. <laughs> so it, it, just look up how much your total income is in the first column and then just look across and see how much you're, you're going to be paying on one more dollar. But uh, like if you're making a, a huge amount of money, you're going to get on one more dollar of Canadian eligible dividends, you're going to be paying quite a bit. But if, if, if your only income is Canadian eligible dividends, your average tax rate is still pretty low because of, the slow run up and the negatives up front. Uh, comparing it to capital gains, for example, which started at 10% and 11 and so on. So uh, the average tax rate, I would argue, for Canadian eligible dividends is always going to be low. Um, but you always stay in the column for the asset. So you, you stay in the appropriate column for the uh, for the asset. So if if you have a little bit of salary and then a whole bunch of Canadian eligible dividends, uh, you're still not going to pay very much in taxes because most of your income is going to be taxed in the eligible column. Um, and then you're you're going to pay a little bit for the salary, right? So if you're if you're making 115 and a hundred thousand of it is in eligible dividends and then 15 is in other in, is is a salary. Then yeah, on that fifteen thousand, you're probably going to pay thirty eight and thirty two, uh, and then you're going to pay fifteen, eight, five, and probably one and and negative six on on the hundred thousand of the uh, of the eligible dividends. So yeah, the the answer is you stay in the appropriate column. Okay, where was I? Two. Um, so yeah, so plan ahead, right? Like I've talked to people who have four investment properties that have appreciated and they, they want to give them to the kids, but I'm like, that's a taxable event. You're going to, you're going to pay capital gains on the appreciation. If you had put them into a trust account, yeah, you would have had to pay a lawyer to establish it. Then you'd have to pay an accountant to do taxes on, on that trust, but there wouldn't be any taxes because it would already be owned by the kids in the trust. Like the kids, if they're five years old, they can't they can't own real estate directly, right? But through the trust, you can. Um, Canada has no gift tax. So what you might want to do is give assets to beneficiaries if you're of, of, of a certain age uh, where you're you're worried, um, then start giving assets to people that you've paid taxes on. Uh, so, so that's not a problem. Um, be careful of like putting your kids on the title of your primary residence or, or of investment properties, because then they are in charge. And, uh, you know, it, it could be drug issues. They could get into, in, into all sorts of debt. And, you know, they, depending on, on who they are, they could sell your your primary residence out from under you just because you try to um, try to avoid probate fees, for example. If they get divorced uh, as well, and they have a couple of investment properties that you basically put in their name, then those are fair game in uh, in the divorce proceeding. So so be careful of stuff like that. Again, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, yeah, keep in mind anything non-registered is taxed as if it were were sold on the day of of your passing. So on the when you pass away, you suddenly have a very very tax uh, heavy year. Uh, so so be careful of that. Uh, my personal plan is uh, the non-taxable stuff like primary residence TFSA. Um, that stuff's going to go to the to the last person that was nice to me, and um, anything that is taxable is going to go to charity. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, there won't be much in taxes on uh, dur during my last year of residence on this mortal coil. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, so uh, designate 
spouse or common law partner as a beneficiary for your uh, RRSP. That way it gets transferred to the beneficiary with no tax. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's in here. Uh, Peter says very correctly, uh, for a TFSA, your spouse or common law partner should be made successor holder, not just a beneficiary. Uh, if if you do have them as a beneficiary, they have uh, the, the same calendar year that you pass away, they can be flipped to a successor holder. There's no reason to have one more thing to do uh, when you pass away. Make sure that if if you are married or common law, uh, that you make those people your successor holder on your TFSA. Um, okay, some advanced tax concepts. I'll just throw this out out to you since we're we're spending the, so much time on uh, on taxes. So lock in the capital gains uh, when you're in a low tax bracket by by selling. Uh, and then buying back e immediately. Capital gains, you can, uh, so, okay, going back to the, the capital losses, remember harvesting the capital losses. If you do that, you cannot buy the same investment back within 30 days, otherwise the, the loss is disallowed. If you have capital gains, you can sell and buy it right back again. So if you know in a given year that you're going to be in a low tax bracket, sell stuff and then buy it right back again because you're going to be paying um, the capital gains in a lower tax bracket. If So you're, you're sort of locking in those capital gains during a low tax bracket. Buy the stuff right back again and then just let it keep appreciating. Uh, withdraw RSPs in a year when you're in a low tax bracket, which is a must have for, for all RSPs. Do the capital loss selling to offset the capital gains in non-registered accounts. You have to wait for the 30 days I mentioned to buy back the losing securities. So if you believe the security is, is a lost cause, just sell it, take the, the, take the capital loss, use it to your own benefit against the capital gain. If you believe this there's still a good um there's still a a good uh, uh stock there but you want to harvest the capital loss then either buy something different but similar uh or wait 30 days. Uh okay, so this is back to the TFSA uh successor holder or beneficiary. If you want to, to designate a friend, not a spouse or common law person to inherit uh, your TFSA, can they be designated as a benefit? Correct, Cindy. They can only be designated as a beneficiary. They cannot be made into a successor holder. Um, I'm not sure who checks, to, to be honest. Uh, certainly not when you're filling out the forms. Uh, especially if you're doing them online, but when it's going through probate, then the verification happens. And if you, you know, if you make your your child your uh, your successor holder, that's the they're going to be flipped down to a beneficiary anyway. I would I would presume, or possibly just put the the whole TFSA would be made part of your uh, your estate. Uh, and I'm not sure which one of those would, would necessarily happen because I'm also not a judge. Um, but yeah, just may, if it's not a spouse or a common law partner, you have to make them a beneficiary. Um, keep registered assets invested so they get the tax deferred growth. Unless you have so much RSP that it'll put you into a high tax bracket at 71 and your OAS is going to get clawed back, uh, then then look at the RSP meltdown where you start taking it at, at 60, uh, which is sort of my plan. Um, uh, another little thing that a lot of people don't know about, you can fill out this form. It's not hard. You just Google T1213. Um, if your 
buying RSPs on your own that your payroll department does not know about, they're not uh, they're not charging you less taxes. So if you fill out this form, you send it to the CRA with proof that you're buying RSPs that your payroll doesn't know about. The CRA will probably towards end of January, if you do it first thing uh, every year, your, the CRA will send you uh, a letter to give to your payroll department to start withholding, deducting less taxes from your, uh, from your salary, from your payroll. So I would, um, I would definitely uh, suggest doing that. So a little bit of paperwork and a stamp, but um, it's you, you're you're uh, avoiding giving the government an interest-free loan uh, for the duration of the year, because they're the your payroll department is withholding and sending to the government more than they should uh, because of the RSPs that the payroll department doesn't know about. Um, and it'd be better if you had that money to hopefully invest, but to play with, right? Uh, the other thing is, um, uh, if you're doing RSPs through your company, then your payroll department should know about that, but I would still check on that. Okay. So that was the end. My goodness. I hope that was useful. Uh, pretty long. Uh, we'll keep, we'll keep going. What time is it? It is, it is eight o'clock. Um, okay. I still got kind of a couple of quick, well, we've got a couple of seminars. You guys want me to keep pushing on here? Can, can you guys stay? Uh, there's a couple of faster seminars. This one was, was a doozy. Okay. So let's, let's keep going. Uh, otherwise, you know, whoever needs to go, obviously, uh, it'll be recorded and, uh, you can, you can watch from here. Sorry about that. Um, so we talked about the different account types. We talked about Canadian stocks, foreign stocks, bonds. Keep in mind, these are the, the building blocks, but ETFs and mutual funds work the same when they contain these, uh, these vehicles. We talked about what goes where. I think we beat that to death. I don't know if if it's easy to absorb, but uh, like over time, um, make sure stuff is going where it's supposed to uh, if you're going to be doing it for a long time, especially. Um, estate planning, we talked about, and some advanced tax strategies. Okay, so some personal finance. Uh, okay. So we'll talk about credit score real quick. We'll talk about mortgages and debt. We'll talk about consumer debt, which is not a good thing. Uh, teaching your kids. Uh, we can skip spams and scams and, or, or go through it really quickly. Talk a little bit about budgeting. So credit score. Uh, this is how your credit score gets calculated. There's two... Uh, there's two agencies in Canada. You can get free uh, credit reports from them uh, online. You used to have to mail stuff in, but now it's online. Uh, and there's a lot of institutions where you can get a free uh, credit score as well. So 10% of your credit score is uh, how many? All right, good night, Deborah. Uh, there's... Uh depending on how many times somebody pulled your credit uh, is uh, is an indicator that you're shopping around and you you could be uh, a bigger risk. They don't know what you're doing or why you're suddenly trying to get more credit. But try to do, if you are going to shop around, try to do it within a two-week period so you only get dinged once. And then it slowly fades away with time. Credit mix, uh, different types of loans, give you a better score in this you know it's only 10 percent, anyways don't get a bunch of loans to to improve this like what they want is you you to have a credit card a home equity line of credit a mortgage uh a, a car loan an unsecured line of credit like those are all the the mix 
uh, I get whatever I need and I'm not going to get a car loan and start paying interest just to get a slightly better credit score. Uh, I'm not going to get a car. <laughs> uh, credit history, uh, how long you've had your, um, your, your credit cards and so on. So closing credit cards is, is a good idea, but also it will hit you here. Uh, so like I've got credit cards that I've kept forever. Uh, so I've got long history. They would rather you to be a, a bad known credit risk rather than to be an unknown credit risk. So it's better to have bad history than to have none, because apparently they have a very lively imagination of what what you could do. Credit utilization is the big one, uh, accounts for 30%. Try to use a third, less than a third of your available credit. So don't max out your credit cards. Don't carry maxed out credit cards. Don't have your credit lines and HELOC past a third of the available credit. If you get more credit available then this improves um but don't don't get stuff just to do a better credit score uh payment history um uh, have you been paying your bills on time so these last two kind of count for the most so check your free credit reports uh equifax and transunion are the official uh, agencies, Borrowell is a third-party company that accesses Equifax uh, or TransUnion, I forget which one. Uh, every so often, pull up your credit report. I've got it in my calendar every six months. Pull it up. And if there's anything you don't recognize, you could uh, have your identity stolen or have had your identity stolen. So be careful um, and uh, check your credit report. And then you can... Uh, you can appeal if something is incorrect. Uh, sometimes they'll put the wrong person's information onto yours and, and so on. So just uh, just check. Uh, so this came from Borrowell. Uh, so it basically, th this happens to be mine back in 2022. I think it's it's about the same these days. So no missed payments, no change to credit utilization. I was at 22% back then. Uh, no derogatory uh, remarks. Average credit age is nine. How many accounts? And here, here were the inquiries. So this sort of mentions the um, what determines that score. Uh, do you have a good credit score? Uh, if you're sort of in the 700s, you're good. If you're in the 800s, you're excellent. Uh, obviously, the better credit score you have, you'll be guaranteed to get loans and you might have negotiating power to get better interest rates as well. Uh, different institutions use use slightly different weightings on stuff. Uh, average Canadian is 672. So average Canadian is is fair. Mortgage and debt, variable mortgages versus fixed. Uh, I'm not going to go into this because I took so long on the taxes. Open means you can put money back in and take it out. Uh, that ends up being sort of a line of credit-ish. Uh, closed means you're prevented from putting additional money in. Um, there's penalties for breaking a mortgage, usually three months worth of interest. So if if interest rates change and you have a, a fixed rate mortgage, it might be worth it for you to break it and pay the penalty and get lower interest rates. Um, whether to pay off a mortgage or to invest is uh, is a sort of a personal thing. I usually draw the line around 6%. Uh, if the interest rate of the mortgage is 6%, that's sort of hard to beat. Uh, consistently, because the 6%, that is what you're saving when you pay off the mortgage. But if if your mortgage is 3%, you should be able to do better investing. So that's sort of the age-old question. The other thing is, is the interest uh, tax deductible or not? Uh, 
So if you borrow to invest, it's in a non-registered account and there's an expectation of cash flow, the, the loan should be uh, uh, tax deductible for the interest. Um, so in that case, that's speaking against paying it off because you're going to not be uh, because of that tax deduction you get from the uh, interest. Um, you have to be comfortable with risk if you're going to be borrowing to invest. Um, and comfortable with debt. Some people culturally or just personally, they, they hate debt and they want to pay it off. And so if that's you and you want to feel comfortable, then pay it off. Uh, some people, me included, I see good debt if it helps your money grow. Uh, if you're using borrowed money to buy appreciating assets, that means you're getting ahead. Bad debt is for consumption or if you're buying depreciating assets. Don't borrow unless your back's against the wall in this case. Uh, borrowing to buy a car, I mean, uh, it's, it is a depreciating asset. There is a value, uh, especially if it helps you make a salary. So you you gotta, gotta think about all of that, but buying a boat is definitely bad debt and going on a vacation on borrowed money is definitely bad debt. Uh, consumer debt, credit cards, uh, I'm not adverse to credit cards. I, if you get a couple of points, fine. If you get some cash back, fine. Uh, choose whatever credit card works best for you, whether for travel or mine are all cash back uh, or uh, air, airline, um, air miles. Uh, you absolutely have to pay the credit card off every month. And studies have shown that people spend more on credit cards than with cash because it, there, there's a little pain apparently when you hand over a bill, you're losing something while with a credit card, you're not feeling that pain. I think if you're an adult and you have good self-control, you should use credit cards. They're convenient. You, you only have to pay once a month. You don't have to carry cash around. If you don't trust yourself, then don't have credit cards. Teaching kids, communicate, share information. Um, you can get, I've obviously never done this, but you can get a trust trading account uh, for, for your child where you're sort of the caretaker, but it, it is in their name, I believe. Uh, and get into stocks that they would be familiar with, like you know, uh, Netflix or Disney and stuff like that. Uh, so that way they kind of see how the stock market works. Um, and it won't, it won't be that pricey. Um, allowance or no allowance for chores. I can't really speak to that. That's your own decision. Uh, savings allowance versus spending versus gifting. So some parents say here's 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever it is. And you have to save a couple of dollars, you can spend a couple of dollars. And then if that's what you're into, you can donate to charity a couple of dollars. So you kind of get into that cadence. Uh, pensions at work really quickly. Defined benefit means they're promising you to pay you a certain uh, amount per month per year. So the risk is on your employer they're promising you a, a specific benefit. Defined contribution means they're investing something for you. They might be matching something that you're doing, uh, that you're investing, but your statement will show hundreds of thousands of dollars, hopefully. So if the stock market goes down, you are the one who bears the risk. Of course, if the stock market goes up disproportionately, then you're benefiting. But a lot of people, especially government pensions, uh, you know, would prefer the defined benefit where you know what you're going to be getting rather than it'll, it'll depend on the stock market with the defined contribution. Uh, most pensions outside of government these days are defined contribution. Spams and scams. Don't click on anything. I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Uh, I, I keep getting phone calls all the time to this day. 
where they're posing as the CRA or, you know, you're going to get arrested, that kind of stuff. Just critical thinking. Don't give out any personal information. Don't give your credit card. It, it, I had one, they phoned me and said they would uh, uh, give me a new credit card and they'll they'll cancel my old one for me. And they they wanted a uh, the credit card number and all that stuff like that's I, they wouldn't do it if somebody didn't fall for it. Uh, I, it's just ridiculous. Um, you know, on your computer have um, have a firewall, have uh, an updated um, virus scanner, have the latest Windows updates, all that good stuff. Uh, don't give out any personal information. I never put my actual birthday, social insurance, especially. Uh, I, I just don't give that to anybody. Uh, budgeting. Uh, so like I track my spending and I compare it to a budget uh, at the end of the year, but I don't stop spending because I've gone past my allocation for the month or anything. Uh, if you have trouble with spending, then yeah, if you've gone past your restaurant budget, you know, in the third week, then in the fourth week of the month, you don't get to, to eat uh, in restaurants anymore. Um, you could you could do it on the monthly basis. Uh, well, I, guess, I guess you generally would want to. Do track your spending. Uh, especially if you want to get financial independence, uh, you would want to um, uh, you would want to to know what your burn rate is, whether you spend thirty thousand a year, forty thousand a year, fifty thousand a year. Know what you're spending it on. Know where your money's going. Uh, if you're going to retire and not do anything may uh, and not go to work anymore maybe you only need one car so see how much money was going to cars how much was going to nice clothes for the office uh so i i started tracking a decade ago or more because i wanted to know my burn rate uh create a budget if you do have problem with money uh jimmy says do i have a specific program to track uh, my budget yeah i use quicken uh, I use Quicken. You can enter in for specific categories of of uh, expenses. You can enter in uh, how much you want to spend. Uh, so, like, like my accountant told me one year that I would be paying about seven percent in taxes. Uh, I sold a, a property in the U.S., so my taxes were forty thousand that year. Uh, so obviously, I went beyond. Uh, so that one I knew about, but there's there's others where, for example, if I expected my uh, condo insurance to be uh, six hundred and fifty dollars and I paid seven hundred and ten, then on December thirty first, I look and I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, I went I went past it. And um, uh, should I adjust the budget? Should I look for a new insurance company? Like it it flags it for you that you didn't meet your expectations basically uh but i i spend so little that i you know if if i if i want to go out with the guys then i'm i'm going to i'm going to go out with the guys uh google sheets uh budget okay i've i've never tried it i'm a big excel person so like i would probably build one from scratch uh but if there's um if there's a pre-made template uh, out there whether for Excel or for Google Sheets, then then absolutely, uh, whatever whatever works for you. Uh, there's also, uh, I know they shut down Mint, but there's like, uh, uh, you need a budget, and there were a couple of others um, as well. Uh, I Usually you have to pay for them, and I, I already had Quicken, which already had all, all the data, so I kind of stuck with that, but Excel would be my other one. Um, so there's different types of budgets. 50, 30, 20, I'll mention really quickly, where 50% uh, of every dollar is used for spending, 30% for investing, and then 20% for saving. So you're actually not spending about half, which that's pretty uh, aggressive. Sort of an easier version is where 50% is needs, 30% is wants, and 
20% is for savings and investing. I, I think the average Canadian saves about 6% of their income. So if you're saving and investing 20%, you're doing, you're doing quite well. Uh, Zero-based budget just means allocate all your money as you see fit and make sure that at the end, uh, you, you know, you you end up with zero. Uh, and of course, make sure that there's saving and investing in there somewhere. Uh, housing, rent, or mortgages should be 30%. And I know there's a lot of people who are beyond that. Groceries and bills should be about 20%, transportation 10 So, I mean, obviously you you make it for yourself, whatever is, is appropriate. Budgeting isn't for everyone. If it makes you cringe, don't do it. Um, okay, just, yeah, tracking the spending so you know how much you're gonna be spending in retirement, I think is a is a good idea. Okay, so that's end of seminar seven. Um, because it's what, 8.30? Yeah. Uh, I'm probably going to call it a night. I didn't get as far as as I wanted. We'll see if we can catch up in the um, uh, in the last session, uh, which will be uh, next uh, Tuesday on the uh, uh, what is it twenty twenty third? Yeah, twenty third. Uh, so the last session is twenty third on the Tuesday. Uh, so. I'm going to conclude uh, kind of the personal finance uh, part. Uh, and uh, so we looked at taxes and credit scores and debt uh, and teaching your kids and budgeting. So I would definitely suggest you track your spending at least for a time. Do it, uh, you know, do it for three months and then just extrapolate from there just so you know what your um uh what your life would look like uh in terms of money so